Hello, this is Digital Accessibility, the people behind the progress. I'm Joe Walensky, the creator and host of this series. And as an accessibility professional myself, I find it very interesting as to how others have found their way into this profession. So let's meet one of those people right now and hear about their journey. All right, well, here we go with another interview as I talk to accessibility practitioners from all around the world. Uh, and today I'm pleased to be talking uh, with Jenison Asuncion. Hello, Jenison, how are you today? Hey there, Joe, uh, I'm doing well, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, I'm talking from my uh, home office on Vashon Island in Washington, which is uh, near Blink Seattle headquarters in Seattle. And where are you talking to us from? I am zooming in from Sunnyvale, California. Uh, closest large city is San Jose. I'm about 35, 40 miles south of San Francisco, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Well, I, I think the, uh, the the one time I had an opportunity to uh, meet you was in San Francisco uh, with the uh, Bay Area Accessibility Meetup Group. Absolutely. Uh, was at Blink's uh, offices there in San Francisco. Absolutely. It seems like forever because of the pandemic, everything seems to have, uh, <laughs> there was pre-pandemic and, and now. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. It's been a while, but like I said, I'm really happy that you uh, uh, asked me onto your podcast. Yeah, well, so much has changed, and uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the meetup group uh, that you, you're involved with and also your uh, uh, the Global Accessibility Initiative Day, but why don't we just start with you uh, kind of talking about your day-to-day -day work, uh, you know, what types of things are you involved with now? Sure. So I am a head of Accessibility Engineering Evangelism at LinkedIn. And in my day to day, one of my one of my primary responsibilities is I own uh, training and education for all of our product engineers across web, iOS, and Android. Uh, so we offer uh, like monthly training. I have an accessibility champions program that I run uh, for our engineers. Uh, so that's one piece of it. The other piece is uh, day to day on call support. So I have someone who works for me who actually does all the training and then also uh, takes care of questions that come through our Slack channels. Uh, we also have daily office hours for our, uh, not only our engineers, but also for our designers. They can come in and show mocks or early builds and have them take, uh, taken a look at for a spot check to see if there are any egregious uh, blocker or, or uh, critical accessibility items. Uh, so that's part of my job. The other, another piece of my job involves uh, being the interpreter, if you will, for all things WCAG 2.1. Um, so if questions come up as to like, which guideline might pertain to a particular UI or uh, what, uh, what guideline or guidelines have been broken based on either feedback we've gotten externally or uh, some internal um, testing that's happened. Um, I'm also part of the accessibility leadership team at uh, LinkedIn. So we spend a lot of time just thinking about like, what are the best processes to put in place? Uh, how do we up our game around uh, test automation? Um, and honestly, a lot of it is just, how do we scale? At, at a company like LinkedIn, uh, we move fast. So we need to figure out different ways to scale accessibility. Um, and then another big piece of my work uh, has to do with uh, external um, representation within industry. So I'm, I represent LinkedIn within an organization called Teach Access, uh, among other uh, affiliations that I that I hold representing LinkedIn. Uh, doing things like this, uh, podcasts, talk mm -hmm. about the work that I'm doing, talk about the work we're doing at LinkedIn, conferences, that kind of thing. And then also uh, working with the different disability communities um, and, and and staying in touch with them and uh, filtering in feedback back into the uh, into the mothership, if you will. So a lot of interesting and different things to keep me uh, out of trouble. All right. Well, you just really made me tired just listening. To <laughs> That you have going on that's that's a really uh, extensive list and, and well I, I I made a few mental notes and I I want to come back and uh, 
touch on a couple of points more specifically, but one of the things I like to do uh, with these conversations is to go back in time and, uh, you know, each person has their own uh, lived life, work life uh, experiences where accessibility has uh, become something uh, important to them and, and ultimately decided to be part of our career. So, yeah, why don't you just take me back uh, and tell me sure. a little bit about your journey? Sure. So um, just more for context and, and information for uh, viewers and listeners. So I'm, I'm completely blind. I lost my vision when I was about two years old. Um, the thing was, back in the day, I mean, my first screen readers were really like family members, my sister and my cousins who would read stuff as I was uh, building games and uh, games and things uh, back way back in the day of uh, Commodore 64s and uh, tape recorders and, and tape, tape discs and all those things. And then I was fortunate because I was growing up as the technology was evolving. So technology for me, it was just, it, it, it all felt natural to me. It didn't feel different or anything. I mean, I, I was going uh, to regular schools, uh, quote unquote, uh, like uh, schools uh, with seeing kids since I was, a, uh, since I was a kid. So as the, as computer and technology was just evolving, I was, I was fortunately being served that up. And uh, again, for context, I was born and raised back in Montreal. I think though, fast forward uh, to where I first got the, the itch of accessibility as a career, I attended a program um, by the uh, Canadian National Institute for the Blind uh, that uh, brought together 24 blind and visually impaired youth uh, from across Canada together uh, over four weeks uh, to get exposed to different assistive technologies or adaptive technologies uh, and basically get exposure to it, amongst other things that the program offered. But at, it was at that program that I was, because I had already been exposed to screen readers and things by that point, but I was witnessing people from, mainly from smaller communities in Canada, many for the first time getting access to screen reader, to a Braille, rec a Braille refreshable Braille displays and screen enlargement software. And it was amazing. There was something there, something magical, uh, not to trivialize it, but it was like just to step back and witness some of these uh, folks who had never used a screen reader before and now had access. And it was very impactful. You know, the, some, some of these kids, like this was a very like big experience for them, first time. And, you know, some, for some of them, it was fairly emotional and, and things like that. And I just said, wow, that's, that's amazing if technology can do that. Now, I came back and I knew that technology was going to be something. I, I wanted to do something that had to do with technology and, and hopefully, like, maybe uh, working with people with disabilities somehow. Um, now, my my issue was my math was not the strongest. And so in order to do computer science, you really have to be strong in math. Um, however, I, I buffed myself off math wise and took two kicks at the can in computer science, one at the, at the community college level and then one again at university. So apparently I don't learn well the first time, um, but that didn't work out. Um, but at the same time, I was also uh, began to work for an organization called the Adapt Tech Research Network. And that was a research team comprised of uh, actual researchers, uh, folks with different disabilities. And what we were doing was conducting grant funded studies, looking into how college and university students with different disabilities and impairments in Canada use technology and how impactful that is. And then uh, eventually, we would look at just campus accessibility from a digital perspective. And so I was, and that, that was all part time. I was going to school. I, I got a master's degree in educational technology, but I was doing this to kind of basically pay for my, uh, pay for my partying, if you will, uh, while I was in school. But, but through that whole time, um, you know, I was learning all about how different 
folks uh, with different disabilities or impairments are using technology, what the pain points were, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was just, again, it was just a job and something interesting to do off to the side. I, I would then graduate from grad school and then head off to do some other stuff. I was working in e-learning and did uh, uh, e-learning development and then project management. Um, but then in 2006, I decided to quit my job and figure out what I wanted to really do. Uh, I think, truthfully, I was burned out a little bit after being a project manager for about five and a half years, and I wanted to see what else was out there. And it was at that point in 2006, uh, in the summertime, uh, friends of mine were, were saying to me, you know, well, why don't you consider doing accessibility? I mean, you're already doing stuff in it. Like, why don't you just do it? And, you know, for me, I had to think about that because I was like, well, it just seemed too easy for me to do, to slip into something like that because I was blind and I didn't want to be pigeonholed or anything. But then I, I look back at the fact that I had a really good um, opportunity to do some other things beforehand, uh, project management and e-learning development. And I'm like, I think it's time now to do something where I, I think, um, will have the most impact. So again, my problem was I didn't have any background in QA or anything like that. So when I started applying for accessibility roles back in Toronto, um, it was tough because when I was interviewed, they'd be like, talk to me about your QA, this and that. And I was like, you know, I don't have any of this. And I didn't certainly didn't have a coding background, although in my stints in computer science, I did learn programming and stuff, but it wasn't web. It was It was more mainframe stuff. And so I was like, okay, maybe this isn't going to work out. Um, but by hook or by crook, my resume ended up at, at the desk of the manager of the IT accessibility team at Canada's largest bank, which is uh, Royal Bank of Canada. And he called me in for an interview, uh, which I thought was only going to be like uh, an hour. Turned it out to be about a two-hour conversation. I missed a haircut. Uh, but we really had a great conversation, and he gave me my first chance. His name was Richard Aubrey, uh, and he gave me my first chance, and he uh, invited me to join the team. And I spent uh, from uh, December 2006 till, uh, what was it, October of 2013 over at the Royal Bank of Canada. And that's where I really cut my teeth and learned everything. Uh, I learned, uh, you know, I got exposed uh, to the world of web development and spent a lot of time with web developers, uh, spent a lot of time with UX and designers at all lines of business within the bank, uh, sitting with them and getting comfortable talking more technically, uh, as well as uh, just understanding uh, the code um, enough to be able to explain in a technical and a succinct way the types of behaviors that were expected uh, and then sitting with UX and design folks, and they would describe to me, you know, what the interaction was, and then I would probe them on what they were doing for uh, color contrast and what they were doing for keyboard uh, interactions, things like that. Um, and, and during that time, I also built out uh, the accessibility procurement, uh, accessibility program. Um, but a lot of that time was spent consulting with uh, my team that I was on, we saw over 200 projects a year. Um, and so there was a lot of different types of web stuff. And uh, even because it's a bank, we have older technology. So there were green screen things. And then uh, as, as I was getting to the end of my tenure at uh, RBC, they were just starting to dig into um, iOS. Um, so I got that early exposure. So I was that was really me uh, going to school in accessibility and really getting thrown in and, and not only learning um, the, the technical pieces, but also the important, I was able to apply the people skills that I learned as a project manager. I will always say that uh, the work I did beforehand did not go to waste uh, because all of those skills, negotiation skills, uh, relationship skills, uh, difficult conversations, um, all of those things that I learned as a project manager have 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 stood me well throughout. I mean, those are the things that they don't teach you in Accessibility 101. Are, are those soft skills that are really so critical um, if you're going to be having conversations? Because you can't just like beat your hand on the table and say, make this accessible. 
Um, you have to step in, you have to understand um, the positions that different people have, why there might be some resistance and figure out ways to, to work with, uh, not force people to, uh, to um, make things accessible. So um, I'll finish my story by saying that uh, in 2013, uh, Wait, I was, before you go, I, no. I, let me jump in because you, no. you've already covered a whole lot of stuff, and I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been yeah. having questions from the start here, so go let me, for let me go just for go back a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things that I think is interesting, uh, wh where you talked about how you got into the project management, you know, phase for I think you said five yeah. years or mm -hmm. six years, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, if for a person uh, like yourself who's uh, blind from a from a young age, often it's difficult uh, to get into positions where you're doing that kind of work, uh, just because tools and processes, you know, in many yeah. organizations aren't set up to you know to be able to uh, you know participate fully, collaborate fully, and uh, so you know I think it's it's great that you were able to have that experience, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that because I sure. think, that, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, who come into, uh, uh, professional world, uh, being blind, it's extremely difficult to, uh, get into those situations. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, in terms of project management, so I had gotten exposed to doing that, uh, in my work with the Adaptech Research Network, I, I project managed uh, all of the uh, early research that, that we conducted. And so uh, I got to learn Excel very quickly um, in terms of using Excel was, was the program I used to, to do project management. Microsoft Project back then wasn't where it is today. Uh, although I did end up starting to use project management toward the end of my tenure uh, as an actual project manager. But so I'd already had some of that exposure and skill set that I'd built up while I was in um, going to school. So when I when I became a project manager, when when they built that role out and I and I did it, um, um, it was it was kind of like an old old hat. And, and the, the running joke I have about project management is it's a lot of it is about herding cats um, you, because you're basically making sure everyone is on time, um, you know, with their deliverables and things like that. And my job is to track, was to track those things. So, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a hassling job, hassling people, haranguing people, finding out where they were and for me to unblock them if they were blocked and to uh, identify risks or issues uh, that might pop up that might impact the project plans uh, and things like that. But a lot of it was... Uh, uh, I was able to do successfully using Excel uh, and I, like Microsoft Word for my own notes and stuff uh, in project meetings. Um, so it wasn't that I was using any uh, higher tech um, um, software or anything like that uh, because I was the one, I was managing the folks who were the ones, who were the brains behind the, the, the work that had to get done. Um, so yeah, and like I said, that what that did teach me though uh, as a project manager was those things like managing a project and and what are what are some of the things that that weigh on on um, timelines and things like that so when I now in my current role I have a better appreciation for what I'm sitting down with a project matter going so you're gonna have to add accessibility into your timelines and such I, I tell them like I know that this might be um, a challenge in the beginning <clears throat> because I was I've been a project manager, so I know what that's like. So you get this automatic kinship with when I'm talking with uh, current project managers to say, I've been there, done that. Um, let's work together to figure figure out how to make this work. Well, it, it sounds like then, um, you know, all that experience really uh, worked well coming into the, the uh, bank situation because uh, uh, QA testing <clears throat> tends to be one of the first places you know, people start start working um, just especially with a you know with having uh, you know being blind uh, from an early age like you are that's <laughs> kind of a natural place to start. But it sounds like you jumped right into doing a lot of uh, program building and that type of thing. Yes, I was very fortunate uh, that I was um, you know, and all credit to my managers <clears throat> who <clears throat> excuse me who 
clearly saw past uh, the the fact that I, I had a disability. Uh, you treated me like everyone else and and gave me the opportunity to to get exposed to stuff like project management. Um, and it, I didn't even know then that that would end up coming in handy later. <clears throat> and to your point around, you know, coming into accessibility, I did not, you know, I did not start off doing uh, QA testing. I ended up getting thrown right into things and, and starting to work directly with projects and doing more consulting work. And, and, and like I said, talking more to the designers and, and to the developers and stuff uh, right away. Now, did that mean I didn't do my share of checking? You know, did people not ask me, hey, can you just check the accessibility of this or that? No, absolutely. I still did some of that. Um, but my, my, more of my job was more on the consulting side of the house uh, and, uh, and that when I moved into accessibility. <clears throat> well, I, um, then uh, kind of that brings us, uh, so, so this is a, does that bring us next to uh, your work with LinkedIn? Is that your next? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So here I was, I, I, I was trucking along at RBC, minding my own business. Um, and in 2012, um, I had the opportunity to travel to San Francisco uh, on my way to, uh, to the CSUN conference in LA. And I had reached out to LinkedIn because I'd been a big LinkedIn user and starting in 2006. And it was more uh, just emailing them to say, hey, um, you know, I'm a user. And, you know, if you folks would be interested in seeing how uh, someone who uses a screen reader uses LinkedIn, I'd be happy to stop by. I'm going to be in the Bay Area. I had no uh, agenda or no eye on ever going to work at, at LinkedIn. I was being kept very happy at the bank. Uh, this is strictly just to, to do this stuff. I... I I had already had the experience of going to other companies in the Toronto area to do the, to do what I call the accessibility talk. So this wasn't new to me, um, but I had been, like I said, I'd been a LinkedIn user since 2006 and I had actually had a, a situation where I had flagged an accessibility issue to them and they were uh, really fast at uh, contacting me and, and finding a workaround. Uh, this was back in 2011 or 2012 as well. So I had already built, started a relationship with them, but anyway, so I went and visited did an hour, um, walked, walked through LinkedIn and people asked questions and all that kind of stuff. And I went home, not, didn't think anything of it. Um, I ended up going for a subsequent visit again when I was back in California um, and then went home. Uh, but then in 2013, uh, I got a message on, actually on my birthday um, over Facebook uh, of all things. Uh, and my my manager, the person who'd become my manager, asked me if I would consider uh, coming to LinkedIn to help formalize their accessibility work. Um, so I was like, "Wow, this this is this is uh, a bit nuts." I mean, I don't have a degree in engineering, and here I am potentially headed off to Silicon Valley. And um, fast forward to November. Uh, 2013. I and so I started on November 11th. So I started my I've celebrated my eighth anniversary with LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, yeah, I came to work at LinkedIn and I started off as a program manager. I then became an engineering manager when I um I, I built and was the first manager of the accessibility engineering team. I did that for three years. And then I um, switched over to my current role, which is uh, head of accessibility engineering evangelism. So those are those are the cliff notes. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, it's definitely uh, a great resume of experience. Um, I want to talk about your uh, community building work because you're you're definitely uh, you know deeply involved in in that. Uh, is, I already, had already mentioned the uh, Bay Area Accessibility Group, which, by the way. Uh, Whereas a lot of groups, uh, well, in the olden days when we were doing physical meetings, would tend to be, you know, relatively local. But you, in in the uh, online time, you're, you've been able to do a lot of events that, uh, you know, are cast pretty widely. And then you're, uh, there's uh, Global Accessibility Day, uh, you know, which is just a wonderful event. Maybe talk about sure. uh, uh, talk about that day, you know, how that 
originated yeah. and you know what people can expect from that. I, I know we as Blink participated yes. in that this year as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, GAD, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, just by way of background. So outside of my work that I was doing at RBC, uh, we're talking like 2011, 2020, yeah, 20, 2010 to 20. 12. Okay, we'll, cat, we'll we'll put some timelines around that. I was in in that period of time. I was looking for ways to make the practice of digital accessibility something that was approachable or accessible to your everyday designer or developer. I was fascinated about finding ways to make that more interesting and something that people would get excited about and want to learn about. Um, so in 2009, I ended up attending something called Accessibility Camp DC. And it was it was an amazing event. It was on a Saturday um, and it was like a bunch of people who didn't know each other got together at this library and we formed like, we basically built a schedule around accessibility topics and there were sessions. It was, it was pretty chaotic in the beginning, but it became uh, fairly organized. This whole bar camp movement apparently was a thing. I had just never been clued into it. But at the end of that day, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, I need to bring this something like this to Toronto. So in 2010, I ended up meeting, uh, hooking up with a bunch of folks in Boston, and we ran something similar in the Boston area, Boston uh, Accessibility Camp. And then in 2011, I ran one of these in Toronto. Uh, and thanks to the folks at OCAD University and uh, Yuta Trevoranis and her team, I was able to do that in Toronto. Uh, it wasn't as chaotic as the one in in DC, I mean, people had to sign up and we, we put uh, topics ahead of time and things, but I was able to still fill uh, a room of like 200 people and we had different sessions and different breakouts and uh, fed them pizza and people were just excited and learning about accessibility. So I continued to run accessibility camp uh, for the rest of the time I, w I was in Toronto. But then uh, 2012, uh, or excuse me, 2011. Uh, I, it was like uh, November of 2011. I was uncharacteristically at home on a Saturday evening and I was trolling Twitter as, as one does. And I came upon this auto, well, I would learn later, it was an automatically generated tweet. And it said something like, uh, new blog post by Joe Devin, uh, accessibility must go mainstream now. And I was like, oh, what is this? And so I activated the link and went to this blog post. And I read this blog post by someone who I didn't know named Joe Devin, who is this web developer in Los Angeles, who basically was ranting. And he was talking about how, um, you know, developers know nothing about accessibility. Uh, they don't know what a screen reader is. And ultimately, there needs to be, we need to have a day. Uh, some sort of global day where people learn about screen readers and accessibility. I went, this, wow, this is perfect. Like, I, you know, this is totally like uh, along the lines of what I was interested in, in doing anyway. So I posted to his blog and the rest is kind of history because we then met by, by phone and I have to say that Joe and I are the two people who should not have been uh, involved in building something like this because we were both overly committed as it was. Uh, Joe was heavily uh, invested in uh, in his network in startups and things out in the uh, Silicon Beach uh, or the Santa Monica area. And I was busy. Um, I, I had my Adaptech Research Network work that I was doing. I had my day job at the bank. I was running uh, accessibility camp. I'd started up a meetup in Toronto uh, by 20, when did we start? In 2012. So I was I was fairly busy too, but we decided that this was something interesting to, to, to try at least. And so we said, okay, let's choose a day. So May 9th, okay. Uh, and then let's just each of us contact our contacts and see what we could do. And so in 2012, uh, we launched GAD or Global Accessibility Awareness Day simply based on us individually contacting people in different cities and saying, hey, would you be willing to do this? Uh, we also like posted things to social media 
which was still fairly early, like in the day social media was, but we still did it. And then, then we started uh, and Gad started uh, Australia, India. We had stuff in Wales, uh, in the US. And I know I'm missing countries, um, but those are some of the big ones. Canada, of course, I, I ran our first event, which was the launch event for the uh, A11Y um, Toronto um, Accessibility and Inclusive Design Meetup Group. Um, so yeah, so that's how it all started, uh, just from a tweet um, that I that I responded to in a blog post, and then Joe and I just ran with it, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, you're, and, and uh, yeah, just for uh, people that may not be familiar with uh, Global Days, there are a lot of uh, disciplines uh, within the tech industry that have kind of picked one day a year uh, to celebrate that particular practice and so you kind of set that one up uh uh for this event and uh in it, in it uh, then creates an opportunity for uh people to uh to start do their they host their own events absolutely, absolutely. Uh, around the world so the point is it's it's more or less decentralized the ideas for people all around the world to get involved host their own events yep. and then you provide a a portal that kind of gives the uh, overall agenda of what's available going on. I've, absolutely, yeah. So if folks go to globalaccessibilityawarenessday.org, uh, right now we're, we're, we're uh, accepting events for, for next year and Global Accessibility Awareness Day from our early days where we just chose a random date, we have now uh, standardized on the third Thursday of May is when uh, GAD happens. And uh, if I could just real quick, this year, was our 10th running of GAD, can't believe it. Um, but the one thing that Joe and I did uh, is we launched uh, this year the GAD Foundation, uh, which basically brings year round energy to what GAD started. And the, the mission of the GAD Foundation is to disrupt the culture of digital product and technology development to include accessibility as a core requirement. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially, you know, we're tired of people saying like, oh yeah, of course we're thinking about accessibility. And then yeah, we're gonna add accessibility and we, we, are, we are gonna disrupt the culture uh, to make sure that accessibility becomes that first class citizen uh, alongside things like security and privacy. And it just becomes an everyday um, piece of how people develop uh, digital products and technology. Is it going to happen overnight? Absolutely not. Um, we're very aware of it, but we're going to use the momentum of GAD and all of the connections and things that we've made over the years through that. But we're going to really be focused on reaching out to the larger community outside of the accessibility community and the community of people with disabilities. We need to, if we're going to make this work, we need your average everyday Joe or Joanne, designer, developer, product manager, um, to to t be uh, exposed to and to be thinking about accessibility. So if you go to GAD, G-A-A-D dot foundation, that's our website, and you can read about the different programs that we have underneath there that we're going to be launching over the next couple of years that are going to get us to that place uh, where the everyday um, designer, developer, program manager, product manager, startup person, everyone will be exposed in such a big way to uh, digital access and inclusion. Well, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that we also include the links uh, in the show notes so that people have Thank that you. available. I'll be able to just click on that and be able to get that. And uh, uh, um, Jenison, I, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, just give us all this detail about your uh, your lived life, your work <laughs> life, and, and community building life. And uh, look forward to uh, meeting you again in person uh, when we can get back to that once again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and uh, for those uh, listening or watching that uh, want to follow me on Twitter, uh, you can follow me at Jenison, uh, J-E-N-N-I-S-O-N. And I also tweet uh, accessibility jobs, because there's a lot more happening. Um, but I tweet using at A11Y jobs. And I also tweet events on digital accessibility using at A11Y events. 
on Twitter. So that's just some more stuff I do to help people learn about what's uh, what's happening out there. And you can always find me, uh, of course, on LinkedIn. Happy to connect. Happy to talk more. All right. Thanks a lot, Jens. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.